If you could have a drink with anyone in the theater world, who would it be? I'm Anthony Caparelli, and I'm running through my list. Each week, I'll sit down with cast members, bartenders, and personalities from New York's theater district and get a behind-the-scenes look at what it's like to live, work, and play on Broadway. Come have a drink with us on Broadway Bartender. Welcome to Broadway Bartender. My name is Anthony Caparelli. We are at New World Stages in the heart of New York's theater district, home to my show, The Imbible, A Spirited History of Drinking. And this week, we're going to start out with a drink that I call the McMurdo, which is kind of like a Manhattan, but a lot colder. So we're going to start with filling up my mixing tin uh, about halfway with ice. You've seen me do this a million times. And I'm going to use some Irish whiskey in honor of our special guest. And I'm going to do two ounces of whiskey per drink. So that's going to be four ounces into the tin. And then some sweet vermouth, again, following that Manhattan recipe. I'm using about a half ounce per drink. And I'm going to go ahead and shake this up. Now, traditionally, Manhattan would be stirred. I like mine shaken. But because I'm going to serve this drink on the rocks or over ice, it doesn't really matter if it's a little bit cloudy from the shaking. And again, I want this as cold as I can possibly get it, McMurdo being, as you'll find out, located in Antarctica, which is significant. Stay with me. I'm going to go ahead, once this is nice and chilled and diluted, I'm going to strain this into two rocks glasses that I've packed right to the top with crushed ice. So this is more like a mint julep service here. And then because, again, it is a Manhattan, I'm going to top it with a couple dashes of bitters and serve it to our special guest this week, Wade McCollum of... Ernest Shackleton loves me. Ernest Shackleton loves me. <laughs> so first of all, cheers, my friend. Cheers, McMurdo. Yeah, let me know what you think of that. Uh, mm. It's cold, but it warms you up, right? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, Ernest Shackleton loves me. This, there's nothing about this show that I don't love. First of all, <laughs> t tell our viewers why Ernest Shackleton, McMurdo, Antarctica, what's going on here? What, what is Anthony thinking? Yeah, Ernest Shackleton Loves Me is an incredible show about Ernest Shackleton, the famous Antarctic explorer from about 100 years ago, uh -huh. who famously was stranded in Antarctica for three years with 28 men, and through a series of miraculous journeys made it back to England with all 28 men alive. And it's one of the most miraculous stories of optimism and survival and strength of spirit and music um, that, that the world has ever seen. And so it's a story of him uh -huh. and a modern day composer and they meet. Now, okay, a, a hundred years ago, him, yeah. Antarctica stranded, modern day composer <laughs> where? In Brooklyn. And how do how, how those two meet? So she is a single mother. Uh -huh. She's an electronica opera composer. And she has been up for 36 hours because she has a newborn child that is not sleeping. Okay. She's at, her, at the end of her financial rope. Things aren't going so well. And so she hasn't slept. And so she makes a dating video to try to find some, somebody, some help. And the Antarctic explorer, through basically she hallucinates okay. in a shackle. <laughs> and that clears up a lot. He Skypes in. And, um, and they end up going on her, the epic journey of Antarctica through, through her apartment. And <laughs> I'm going to go with you. Suspension of disbelief on this one. You said she Skypes Yeah. Him? So, so Ernest calls in first. Okay. And she thinks she's going crazy, which she sort of is. Okay. And then Jacques Cousteau uh, calls in, uh, Ponce de Leon, all these famous explorers throughout history start wanting to date her. And she progressively is, what's happening? What's happening? Finally, Ernest calls in and says, if only there was a way we could see each other and you could see what I'm seeing. And she says, well, there is Skype. And so she pushes the Skype button, and he pops up on her back wall on these huge 15-foot video screens. Okay. And so I'm on the boat, and I sing her songs, and I'm off stage on a green screen doing this live as a performer. And you play Ernest, I obviously. play Ernest, okay. yeah. And all the other people in her life as well. So it's a two-person show. So including Jacques Cousteau, yeah. Ponce de Leon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and so he Skypes in, and then he ends up coming through her refrigerator. And he takes her to Antarctica. Her apartment turns into Antarctica through projections. Um, it's quite an amazing design. And her coffee table becomes a rowboat. We open it up. We row through the freezing Antarctic Ocean. And she learns all sorts of incredible, incredible fortitude and strength and optimism through going on the journey. And she ends up conquering certain obstacles in her life. 
That is an amazing premise <laughs> for a musical, I have to tell you. <laughs> really? What, so how did this, what, was, what is the genesis of this story, this project? How did this happen? Joe DiPietro, um, incredible book writer, Memphis, um, I Love You, You're Perfect, Now Change. I'm um, extremely familiar, believe it or not, he was um, actually friends with my aunt. Oh. Yeah, I, I, completely unbeknownst to me. They, be, they just became friends. Through, she was a teacher, um, and they met. I don't know how they met, but my aunt was one of these people who when you meet her, you're friends with her for life. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was actually at the uh, the opening performance of Memphis. Oh, wow. um, yeah, so and so Joe, that's I didn't realize he was involved in this part. I can't yeah. call him Joe, I don't know him, but uh, <laughs> Mr. DiPietro. Okay, so go ahead, that's really cool. I didn't know, honestly, yeah. he was involved in this project. Joe met the composing team, which is Valerie Vagoda, who's my co-star and lyricist, uh -huh. and the electric violinist from Groove Lily and Cindy Lauper. And uh, she's the lyricist, Brendan Milburn is the composer, and they met at a, I think it might have been at New World Stages, maybe at some musical theater convention. And they decided they wanted to work together, and Valerie was looking at doing a one-woman show. And he said, what would you be interested in writing about? And she said, ah, you know, I'm not interested in sort of autobiographical stuff. Something epic, something optimistic, something incredibly inspiring and strange and bizarre, like the story of Shackleton. And he said, well, Shackleton, that's an interesting idea. And then he did some research and he found out that Shackleton brought along a banjo on their journey, a 14 pound banjo when everybody was allowed like two pounds of stuff. Yeah, this was like going to the moon back then. Like Exactly. You... Okay. And he, he insisted that they bring the banjo and that they keep it on the journey. And it kept the men's spirits alive and they would have hoedowns on the ice. And so once Joe figured that out, he said, that's our in, is this instrument. And so they basically wrote the entire score around the banjo. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, and you played the banjo? I didn't, but when I got hired, I learned. <laughs> you, you're kidding me. <laughs> no. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And what other instruments are played in the show? Um, I play a little guitar. Um, she plays the electric, six, uh, six string electric violin. Um, she plays the drums. She plays the banjo. Um, she does all live looping, so she's doing looping pedals, she's playing um, timpanis and drum sets and trigger pads, she plays the vocoder, she plays the keyboard. Whoa. She's sort of a unicorn of all, of all kinds. She's a, she's a really magical human. Wow, amazing. Yeah. So from what I understand, the show really takes advantage of technology yeah. in that, and more than just audio, right? The, you mentioned giant screens and stuff. Is that like a big part of, of the whole experience? Yeah, yeah. So musically, it, it, uh, it uses all sorts of cool looping technologies to uh, create these huge epic orchestral sweeping cinematic score to the journey. And then video, we're using live projection with green screen footage that's actually the photographs and video footage of the actual Shackleton journey. Because they brought along a photographer and a videographer in 1915 who made a bunch of movies and they survived the journey. And so we're using those actual photographs and videos to, to both Skype on and also to like, once we're on stage, they envelop us. So really? Quite amazing. So where is it? Uh, second stage is Tony Kaiser Theater, 43rd and 8th. Okay, great. Yeah. And yeah. where is it in the production sort of life? We are, had our third preview yesterday and we have three weeks of previews before we open. So lots of changes are coming at us and Joe is working furiously and it's my favorite part of the process is when we're trying out new stuff and he'll give me new pages right before the show and I quickly sort of memorize the jokes and go out and try them out. It's my favorite part. I just really? think, I think it's so thrilling. Now explain again to our viewers who might not be familiar with how theater sort of at this level in New York works. Pre so you've, uh, if I can to see it, I pay full price for ticket, I go in and but you're in previews, which means you can continue to change the show as much as you want? Yeah, to a certain degree. You know, a lot of the musical stuff is somewhat fixed because right. of the technology used in order to create it. Although we have a new opening number and we have a new 11 o'clock number that we've plugged in for this. We've, did it. we've done three previous productions of it and uh, two new musical sections have been plugged in for the New York show. Um, so yeah, things might be on the flight. We're in rehearsal for five hours a day before the preview that night. So during those five hours, we might be rehearsing new scenes, we might be rehearsing new techno te technical cues and stuff like that. And so it is, it's quite thrilling. I, I really enjoy it. That's amazing. And so you're opening in three weeks? May about 7th, that? I think. Okay. Something like that. One it, day at a time. And is it a limited run, or are you guys going to see how it goes? It is. It's a limited run. We're going till June 11th, I believe. Okay. And then maybe we'll find a new home. 
fantastic. Yeah. So this is a lot of work then for like the, this one month. How, you, how many roles do you play? Seven, but two of them are new as of just a couple of days ago. So I think it's seven. I was trying to count in the shower this morning. Um, some of them are voiceover, so I'm okay. backstage kind of doing voices that are calling in. Some of them are only on camera. Uh, some of them come on stage. <laughs> and so three to four days ago, you were playing five roles. I think so. And now yeah. you're playing seven roles. Yeah. So life, life of a performer in New York. <laughs> That's unbelievable. And I understand that you are quite accomplished with dialect. <laughs> I mean, there are quite a few dialects in this show. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of dialect. And I, let me tell you why. I can't do any. <laughs> Zero. I do none. I lived in North Carolina forever. Can't do a southern accent. Uh, lived in New York. And so, tell, can, can you do a couple for us? Well, like, I mean, I, mean, I, I hate when people say that because then I have to give you something to say, right? <laughs> I don't know. I, mean, I don't know if all of them are classified as dialects. There's like, there's like a Queens guy at the top. And then there's like a guy that talks like this, and I don't know if that's a dialect. That's, those are, yeah, well, they were definitely different it. accents. And then Ernest Shackleton, of course, is British, so he talks like this, of course. And he has a very low voice, and he sings a bunch. And then Bruce is like from California, so he's kind of like a surfer guy. And, but none of those are really, this, only the this, British this is really dialect. fascinating to me. No, that was really good, by the way. <laughs> Cheers, that was awesome. Where are you from? Uh, West Coast. My dad's a musician. Oh, okay. So performing family. Yeah, he's a drummer. So I, I was born on the road in a rock and roll band and uh, didn't... Literally? Literally, and did not settle down until I was five and didn't realize that people stayed in houses or one place until I was about three or four. And when I found out they did, I was, I was devastated for them. I thought, <laughs> <laughs> how boring. <laughs> you don't get to live in a car. And go, go place to place. You know, it was always like an adventure. We were always onto the next thing, the next gig, the next town. It was always new, new information. So did your parents support your decision to become a performer? Yeah. Or were they you know, like, the I don't know if we want this for him? They couldn't tell me you couldn't make a living being an artist. So that's one, you know. It's like smokers telling the kids they can't smoke, exactly. right? Exactly, exactly. Okay, so when did you know that, you, that this was the life for you? Oh, I was about 13 or 14. I, I went to school in Ashland, Oregon, home of the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Wow. And so it's a, it's a unique town and that its primary industry is theater. And they ended up teaching our high school drama department. And so I had really, really incredible mentors at that really key moment of life. And uh, I did a play when I was 14 and it was a clear fit. I thought, this is what I'll do for the rest of my life. I dropped out of high school, got my GED, went to college, graduated at 19, and I've been acting ever since. You gotta be kidding me. So I knew, I, once I knew, I was like, this is it. No doubt about it. Whoa. Yeah. And, and you've been actually working ever since. I have, that... yeah, I've been really blessed, super lucky. Yeah, going job to job. Hey, what an accomplishment. Congratulations, wow. that's fantastic. And you, and you, hardest working man in show business. I don't know about that, but I'll, I'll know. take it. So, one of the things that I want to learn, um, and I mentioned this to you before we started, I've been trying to learn the banjo for literally five years. And and I, as I as I told Wade, I got the first like four bars of Rainbow <laughs> Connection, which to me is the stairway to heaven a banjo, um, but you brought your banjo, right? I did. Can you can you play some stuff for us? Because I just I just think it's like first of all, that's a gorgeous banjo. Thank I you. think it's just one of the most amazing. You know, I learned to play the banjo for the show, and the very first time I played it in front of strangers was on live morning television in Seattle when we did our our world premiere. And I was so terrified. I went on. I went on camera, and I thought, "This is the first time I'm playing this." Um, and now it's sort of second nature. I took a. I took a lesson with a, a hipster in Seattle who taught me how to do the claw hammer. <laughs> I know what that is. Yeah. I can't do it, but I know what it is. <laughs> and then I played in a couple times. Do you want me to sing a little? Bit? Yeah, I would love for you to sing a little. So they're like having a hoe down on the ice just to pass the time. Um, Don't you give your money to no explorer? Adventure fills the heart, but not the purse. He'll tell you there'll be riches, and the polar ice be witches, but you'll lose your shirt and all your cash or worse. He'll tell you anything to change your mind, tell you how they're in a bind, how they're on the verge of something great. Then they'll promise you the moon, the rent comes due, they change their tune. Then you realize it's much too late. 
<laughs> Wade McCollum, Ernest Shock of the Leslie. Dude, that was freaking awesome. So wait, how long have you been playing? Well, how I mean, long have you been with the show is the real question there, I guess, right? Yeah, we premiered in Seattle a few years ago. I'm bad with linear time, but I think okay. it was 2014. Maybe 15? So that's only like three years max of banjo playing. Yeah, but I really fell in love with the instrument. I mean, Isn't it's it a, a great instrument? instrument? It's a gorgeous, gorgeous instrument. It has a beautiful history. I love what it represents. I was gonna ask you, did you, did you see the, um, the, the Netflix documentary on the banjo? No. Oh, there's an amazing Netflix doc documentary. I think Steve Martin actually oh. put it together. And it's the whole history of banjo from Africa. What? Yeah. I, Dude, you gotta go watch it. I like, know what I'm doing tonight. Go watch it, it's incredible. That's great. Um, yeah, but I just think it's, I mean, you just said it, the history, the sound, is, it's, it's all just, it's gorgeous. It's a folk instrument, and I'm a, I'm a big proponent of not losing folk tradition as yeah. technology sort of invades our lives. It's beautiful, but also, let's maintain some folk tradition. So interesting way. choice of instrument in a very high-tech show that the banjo was the focal point. Was that intentional, do you think? Well, it's just historically accurate. It's what you he know? used. Ernest brought one along, and they played. So that's just part of their story. Wow. Yeah. So what's it been like going for the sh through, going, being with the show for the three years before it got to where it currently is? I mean, amazing. I, I love doing shows more than once. I love doing it, uh, taking some time away. You know how things steep in yeah. your subconscious, and and you come back to it, and vocally, and also sort of character-wise, things settle. They settle a little bit mm -hmm. deeper. And there's a lot you can sort of build on. A foundation is sort of set up. Yeah. Um, so each time it just feels like maybe candle wax. It gets a little more sophisticated, a little bit more nuanced, because there's more sort of um, confidence to lean on. And, uh, and also the, the writing has gotten better. I feel like the writers have been really doing their work. Each time they've made changes. And Boston, you know, was a, it was a huge hit in Boston. I won, we won all these awards, and it was a really fantastic time. And that was just last year. Um, so I feel like, you know, we keep... That bodes well. Yeah. Really cool show, man. I'm just a big fan of, of anything that's um, really kind of outside of the box. I think that's really <laughs> cool, and it sounds like you guys it's live outside. way outside of the box, man. Yes! Um, so, I always ask all my guests, any experience bartending or working as a server in a restaurant? <laughs> or? No, not officially, but, you know, my, because my dad played bars my entire childhood, I basically just hung out in bars So all they're kind of the like home to you? Kind of, yeah. All right, awesome. Yeah. So, um, I am going to make a drink or I'm gonna have you make a drink okay. um, that I named in honor of the show uh, called the Nimrod. <laughs> so why don't you explain right. to our viewers why that's a significant thing. Isn't that the name of one of his ships? It's the name of the ship, yes. and I think it's the one that actually got stranded. Yes. I'm, I'm not sure. It's a um, tragic story, the tragic. Nimrod, yeah. Yeah, it's a tragic story, but I just think it's a great name for a it's drink. It's a great name for a drink. Is and it? It, it, you know, it got crushed and fell under the ice in Antarctica. It has inherent drama. Yes, it yeah. got deconstructed. Ah. And so we are going to make, and he, where was Ernest, was, was an Irishman, correct? He he was born in Ireland and left for England when he was 10, so yeah. So we are gonna do a deconstructed Irish coffee. Ah. Well, you're gonna do it. You okay. up for that? Yes. So why don't you switch places with me here, and I'm gonna make this real easy for you. You just come right here, and I'm gonna talk through the whole thing. Great. So you jump back there, and we are gonna start with a couple rocks glasses, okay. and we're going to begin with all things Ernest Shackleton Loves Me, with ice, and yes. in there you can see there's regular ice, but then there's some coffee ice oh, cubes yes. that I made. And you should have, uh, yeah, just put one of those coffee ice cubes in each of the rocks glasses, and that's the coffee part of our deconstructed Irish coffee. And then of course Gorgeous. we need Irish whiskey, yes. which should be right down in that speed rail. Yes. Great, nope, that's nope. Uh, sweet vermouth, the one right next to it. Fantastic, and I want you to put uh, about an ounce and a half. So you're gonna turn it straight upside down and count okay. to three over each of the glasses. Ein, zwei, drei. Perfect. Ein, zwei, drei. Oops. Great, that's it. And now we have some uh, heavy cream that's actually some half and half. And all, all right. I want you to do is pour that very gently right onto the middle of the ice cube in each of those glasses. Don't be too nervous about it because it's gonna, that's it. And just go a little bit more. Yep, you can do a little bit more than that. All right. Fabulous. And that is our Nimrod. Yes, Nimrod. Or our deconstructed Irish coffee. <laughs> Tell me what you think of that, my friend. Cheers. Cheers. Ah. 
Aha. That works. Decadent, delicious, deconstructed. Yes, and the coffee <laughs> will start to melt through the drink and the experience, it's a journey in a glass. Yes, and we'll have caffeine to keep us up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love it, my friend. Nicely done. Uh, website for the show? ErnestShackletonLovesMe.com, I believe. Do you have a personal website or anything uh, that you want to, any projects or anything you want to plug or anything like that? Uh, Wade, WadeSong.com is a website, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I Good did. to know. <laughs> Wade McCollum, Ernest Shackleton loves me. Thank you Thank so you. much for coming. This has been wonderful. I can't wait to see the show, especially now that I know where it is. Ditto. That will help me tremendously. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Thank you. Thank Folks, you. check us out, broadwaybartender.com for recipes, uh, links to our guests and their shows. Drink well, drink responsibly. Don't you give your money to no explorer. Adventure fills the heart, but not the purse. He'll tell you there'll be riches, and the polar ice be witches, but you'll lose your shirt and all your cash or works. He'll tell you anything to change your mind, tell you how they're in a bind, how they're on the verge of something great. Then they'll promise you the moon, the rent comes due, they change their tune. Then you realize it's much too late.